Hi, this is Math 372 Complex Analysis Lecture 12. In the interest of saving the college money, we are periodically turning off electricity in various rooms. Uh, we're going to beta test it here today. So we will try to concentrate on the center part of the board. So if you need more time to write things down, just let me know. I'm just going to quickly restate the three big results. We have Boucher's theorem, which says if f and g are holomorphic on an open set omega, and I don't think we ever use omega in this class for something other than an open set, then if the absolute value of f is strictly greater than the absolute value of g on a simple closed curve gamma, then f and f plus g have the same number of zeros inside gamma. And different books will write this different ways. Sometimes they'll have two functions, f and g, and you'll look at maybe f minus g or something like that. Notice that from this, it's clear that, the abs <coughs> that f cannot have a zero on gamma because the absolute value of f is strictly greater than g. We already saw how, as a consequence of Rouchet, we have the fundamental theorem of algebra. So there's lots of proofs of the fundamental theorem of algebra. This is another complex analysis. Next one is the open mapping theorem. If f is holomorphic on an open omega, then f of omega is open. And then the last is the maximum modulus principle. f holomorphic and non-constant, then the absolute value of f cannot attain its maximum in the interior. So if it attains its maximum, it's going to be on the boundary. And if you have you know, something that's nice, we know from real analysis that a continuous function attains its maximum and minimum. If it can't be in the interior, it has to be on the boundary. You could look at it another way and say that the maximum is on the boundary, but this is a little bit more information. Because if you just say it attains its maximum on the boundary, it could also attain that on the interior. And it would be an interesting exercise to talk about uh, if you knew it attained its maximum in the interior and on the boundary, does that mean that the function has to be constant? So we're going to just explicitly throw away the constant functions. So what I'll do first is I will show how the open mapping theorem applies the maximum modulus principle to just motivate why we care so much about all of these. Okay? And then for those of you who are coming in late, uh, we are about to have a visit from facilities, I hope, who will try to figure out why we do not have illumination in this classroom. I will see how much I can provide myself. All right. Is the open mapping theorem, is this true for real variables? Is f of an open set an open set for real? OK, so give me an example how open mapping could feel in, a real, in the real case. Yes? OK. So this maps minus 1, 1 to the interval 0, 1 with a bracket like that. So open mapping feels on real variable functions. Yes? Another example would be um, sine of x taken over the whole real number, right? Yes. So from yep. To one to one. Okay. And so and in fact, it doesn't even have to be the whole real line. As long as we have something that contains yeah. a whole period of 2 pi, yeah. then we can see it can map open sets to closed sets. Yeah. So. Complex analysis, yet again, is very surprising. All right, what about this result that the maximum has to be on the boundary, that the maximum can't be attained in the interior? Can you give me an example of a real function that attains its maximum in the interior? Yes? OK. So if we look at that on minus 1, 1, here's our function, bless you. And so the maximum value would be at 0. If we look at f of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared, we would also see the maximum is at 0. So the behavior must be very different when we shift to the complex plane. What's going on here? Well, when I shift to the complex plane, if I take x to be pure imaginary, then when I square it, I'll get an extra negative sign, and that will reinforce, and it will get larger. Over here, if I take x to be pure imaginary, then I'll get a negative sign, and that makes the denominator smaller, so it makes the whole thing larger. So we can begin to see why maybe something like the maximum modulus principle could be true, that when we're looking at things in the complex plane, we have more freedom in terms of changing signs. If I give you x squared, I can't change the sign of that as I vary through the real numbers. But as I vary through the complex numbers, I can actually try to align things. 
All right. So, you know, given that Williams has not paid its full electricity bill, we have a restricted blackboard space today as we have no lights. So I'm going to try to keep working on this section because this looks like it's the best lit section on the board. Yeah. You know, it's a little hard to... So I, I, I will try to keep moving a little bit, I guess, and see how it goes. All right, so let's... Proof of maximum modulus. So we're going to assume the open mapping theorem and use this as a motivation. You know, it may not be clear why we care about f of an open set is an open set. You know, this isn't true in real variable. Well, here's an immediate consequence of this. Here's an immediate explanation of why we care about it. All right. So here is our set omega. We have our function f. Imagine f takes its maximum at some point. Say maximum at z0. Assume not. So absolute value of f is largest at an interior point z0. Okay. So when I apply f, it has to map z0 to something. Let's call it w naught. So here's f of z naught, known as w naught. Okay. And if you want, you can think of it as you know here's a scale. I'm plotting the absolute value of f, and here is the absolute value of f of z naught. We know f is an open map. It maps open sets to open sets. So the image of f has to be open. What does it mean now, since this is a point in the image of f? What does it mean for this to be an open set? Yeah, there's got to be a small neighborhood about this point as open. As open, there exists a neighborhood of w naught in f of omega. And so then there must be something in through here that gets mapped to that. And so now, if I look at these points, you know, if you imagine here's, you know, zero in the complex plane, just draw the line connecting zero to w naught and keep flowing. And you'll get something larger. Because it's open, just draw, so go from zero to w naught, keep going. And that's the proof. So this is a really nice consequence of mapping open sets to open sets. It means we can keep going in this direction. Whenever you have a result like this, you should always then go back and revisit the real cases and see what breaks down. This, I might just be missing something really obvious, but why is it that if you keep on going in that direction, you're guaranteed to have an increase in the absolute value of this? Well, because we, we look at 0 to w naught, and we're looking at a circle of radius w naught. Because I have an open set here, I have a small little disk mm -hmm. that's contained in f omega. So that means if I just continue moving in this direction, so I'm going in the same direction as w naught. Now look at, say, 1 plus delta, where delta is a small real number, w naught. That's going to be in the same direction. I'm not going to change the angle, right. but I'm going to change the radius. So why does that mean that f of 1 plus delta times w naught is going to be bigger? No, it's not. It, it means there's some point here that must hit this point here. This is f of omega. So any point in here is hit by some point in here. You give me some point here, say w1, there's a z1 that goes to that. Right. And so this point now is further from the origin. So the absolute value of this point is greater than the absolute value of this point. Oh, yeah. You give me any point in this disk, yeah. okay. call that w1, there's a z1 that maps to that. Yeah. And so there's many points that would work. All we need is one. So again, I strongly urge you to go back and look at the examples that failed, you know, that where this result is not true in the real case. Okay, so we've now shown that the maximum modulus theorem is true if the open mapping theorem is true. You can, I believe, prove open mapping without proving Rouchet, but let's prove Rouchet first, and then we'll prove open mapping. 
and then as time permits, we'll discuss how to maybe prove open mapping directly. And it will allow me to review something that is almost surely not have been covered in a real analysis course you've taken, but it's a result you should have seen. All right, so let's look at Rousseau. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use one of the most important concepts in mathematics. It's the idea of interpolating. So you start at time zero with something that you understand. And then you move forward, and at time one, you end up at the quantity you want to understand. And the goal is at every moment in time, you understand how things change. And then, given that you know how things start and you know how things change, you know how things end. What is the easiest type of change to understand? Nothing. So, you know, I am very good at doing nothing. All right? So let's consider the following. Let's let h of h sub t of z is f of z plus t g of z. So what is h0 equal to? It's just f of z. And h1 of z is just f of z plus g of z. These are the two functions we want to study for Rouchet's theorem. How do we count the number of zeros that h has inside gamma? Or h of t has inside gamma? Yeah. So nt, the number of zeros of our function h, well, I'll just leave it, we can just call it nt is equal to 1 over 2 pi i integral over gamma h prime of t over h of t, uh, not, I'm sorry, h prime, h t prime of z, h t of z, dz. And this is by the argument principle. <coughs> you know, this counts the number of zeros subtracts the number of poles. Since our functions are holomorphic, there's no poles. OK. We need to just make sure everything is well behaved. Is it possible that the denominator h t of z could ever be 0? No, why not? It's the magnitude of f is strictly greater than the magnitude of g. So because it's strictly greater, there's no way that ht could be equal to 0 on gamma. It could be 0 elsewhere, but it can't be 0 on. So as f is greater than g on gamma, ht is greater than 0 on gamma. OK? So this is never 0. This is just going to count the number of zeros. So n0 is the number of zeros of f inside gamma, n1 is the number of zeros of f plus g. And at every moment in time, it's an integer. We're almost done. What do we need to know about this function? It's continuous. Claim nt, or if you want to write it as n of t, is continuous. Also integer valued. So we talked earlier in the semester about classification theorems. We classified all meromorphic functions. I will leave as an exercise to classify all continuous const I'm sorry, all continuous integer valued functions. So all we have to do <coughs> is show this is continuous. How do we show it's continuous? So these are continuous. The derivative is continuous. The denominator is non-zero. That's still continuous. We're now integrating it along a curve of finite length. Everything's fine. 
If you wanted to do it really formally, you could replace T with T plus H, subtract, show the difference is small, and then you're integrating it over something of bounded length. But, you know, it's continuous. And since it's continuous, the only way it can you know, be integer valued at every moment in time is if it's constant. And that's Rouchet's theorem. Okay. Any questions on Rouchet? So, you know, again, the question is always, you know, is this a useful result? We saw that it proved the fundamental theorem of algebra, which was nice. You know, what else can we use it to prove? Well, one thing I think we can use it to prove is the open mapping theorem. That we want to show that um, given any open set and a non, I'm sorry, and a holomorphic function, that f of omega is open. Technically, I do have to put in a slight restriction on f. Yeah, it's not. I really should put not constant. F is not constant. If I took f to be constant, oh, actually, no, we need the light today. <laughs> That's more important than the noise. Um, if f was constant, let's say f of z was always 5, then the image of omega is just the closed point 5. So we want f to be a non-constant function. All right. Yeah, there's no, uh, we're, we have class right now, but the electricity is not working on the lights. Okay. All right. So let's prove the open mapping theorem. Proof of open mapping. So, as always, here's omega, here's z naught, here's w naught. And we want to show, given any point close to, sufficiently close to w naught, there is some z that's mapped to it. All right? So let's write down the goal. Goal. If z is sufficient, I'm sorry, if w is sufficiently close to w naught, there exists a z in omega such that f of z is equal to w. OK? So given that this is following the proof of Rouchet's theorem, what do you think will be useful? Probably Rouchet's theorem, right? So we need to write down functions in such a way that we can map things. So I want to use the same notation um, Because just in case this lecture does not record well, I will refer people to the video from 2015. And so in 2015, I used, I forgot to put the subscript, I want GW of Z to be F of Z minus W. And I can write this as F of Z minus W naught plus W naught minus w. So again, the hardest part in these problems is figuring out how you want to apply things, how you want to set things up. And so in my notes, I actually don't have the subscript w, but in the additional comments for the lecture, I make a big deal about putting the subscript to w. Um, I like to put the w here to remind myself I'm looking at a function and I'm building it up, trying to understand what's going on at the point w. And so w is going to be some point close to w naught. If I use Rouchet's theorem, the only way Rouchet's theorem is going to be useful is if I have some function f that's strictly greater than g along some closed curve, and I have to be able to know something about the zeros of f, or the zeros of f plus g. I've got to know something about the zeros of one of them and use that to get information about the zeros of the other. Now here we're adding zero. We're subtracting w naught and then adding it backwards. Then adding it back. So this is a function of z. 
what can you tell me about this function of z? It has at least one zero. Where is this function zero? Zero at z naught. Zero at z naught. Great. We have a function that has a zero. All we need now is that the absolute value of this along some boundary is less than the absolute value of this. Is that going to be true? So what's interesting here is we have some freedom. Z is varying in omega, and then W is varying independently in the output space. Right? As I vary Z, does this function here have any Z dependence? No. This is just some fixed number. Right? No Z dependence. So all I need to do is show that a small circle about w naught is not mapped to w naught, right? If I show a small circle about w naught is not mapped to w naught, then this will have a minimum value because it's a continuous function. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sick. I'm not supposed to be yelling and exerting my throat, but it's just too hard not to be excited, right? If we can show that this is not equal to w naught on a small circle, it's got a minimum value. And then I just choose w to be so small that this is less than that minimum value. So we win if there exists a circle of radius delta about z naught such that f of z does not equal w naught on the boundary. Everybody agrees? So if it's not zero on the boundary, it's got to have a minimum value and absolute value because we can just look at the real function absolute value of this. And then you choose w naught, then you choose w naught. Win by taking w such that the absolute value of w naught minus w is less than the minimum of f of z minus w naught over 2. And it's the minimum on that circle. So all we have to do is prove that there's such a circle. Do you think there's such a circle? Why? Ah, good. So if if we can't find such a circle, then that means for every circle, there's at least one point which is sent to W0. And then we'll get a point of accumulation. So assume no such circle. For each n, take circle of radius 1 over 2 to the n about z naught. Do I have to take radius 1 over 2 to the n? Could I take radius of 1 over n? Yeah. I, I, I like you know erring on the side of caution and giving myself a series that converges if I sum it. I don't really need to because I'm not going to sum it, but it's just not a bad habit to get into. So you get point Zn on circle such that f of Zn equals w naught. But Zn accumulates to w naught. Thus f is constant. And so either we have an open set or we have an open map. And that's the proof. Okay. 
Any questions about this? Yes? I guess I'm a little bit confused about the, the part where you see that we can fix w for q varying z. Well, so this is a function of z. And this is why I, I, I go on at great length in the additional comments about why I want a subscript w here. So you give me a w, and I form this function g w of z. So for each point w that's sufficiently close to w0, I'm going to look at a different function. <coughs> and then what I can really be doing is, first, I can just look at this part. This part has no w dependence. This is really a function of two variables. But I'm varying them, in some sense, independently. You fix w, and then I vary z. And I can make z so close to z0 that this is not going to be 0 in absolute value along the boundary. And then, since w is free, if I just choose w really, really, really close to w0, then I know this in absolute value will be less than that in absolute value on the boundary of the circle. And then I can use Rouchet's theorem to say that this and this whole thing have the same number of zeros. And what does it mean for gw of z to be 0? It means I've got some z such that f of z equals w. Up at the top, you say if w is sufficiently close to w naught, then there exists a z in Yes, omega. yes. So is that a different z than the z's down below? The, the z's? Yeah. No, we're showing that this function has the same number of zeros as just this function. right? Rouchet's theorem says that the number of zeros of this function inside gamma is the same as the number of zeros of this. Well, what are the zeros of this whole function, this gw of z? The w naughts cancel, so what does it mean to be 0? It means f of z minus w equals 0. It means f of z equals w. So if gw of z has a 0, it means we found a z such that f of z equals w. So we found a solution. We found a point that's mapped to w. And what you do is you take the target point that you want, you take the w that you want, and then you search for the z. So we will be looking at different functions. Well, the functions are going to differ in very trivial ways. You just change which function you're looking at. OK. Any questions about this proof? There's a lot going on here. It, you know, The big idea is to use Rouchet's theorem in a clever way. What I thought I would do is I think we're in a good shape in terms of how much material we've covered that I'd like to try to do another proof on the fly of the open mapping theorem to just try to understand what's going on with complex analysis. Let's say we don't understand Rouchet's theorem. And we want to try to do the argument without using Rouchet. Is it possible? All right. So there's only a couple things that could happen. We could feel miserably and give up in disgust, but then have a greater appreciation for Rouchet's theorem. We could come up with another proof that's really messy and have a greater appreciation of Rouchet's theorem. Or we could come up with a better proof than Rouchet's theorem and realize Rouchet's theorem is overrated. Okay. So, and of course. It's possible that you know, maybe we don't come up with a better proof than Rouchet's theorem right now, but maybe there is a better one out there, and we just haven't found it. So proof of open map take two. OK, so as always, here's omega. Here's z naught, here's f, here's w naught, which is f of z naught. Without loss of generality, what does w naught equal? Zero, right? We could always adjust our function and just say, let's assume the target point is zero. All we have to do is subtract w naught from f. So this will make the algebra a little bit simpler. What should we do next? So we made the target point 0. 
What should we do next? We turn the target point to zero. Who's next on the chopping block? Z naught. What should Z naught be? Zero, zero right? Because all we have to do is, is shift. So you know we could let g of z equal f of z minus w naught, and then we could let if we want h of z be f, oh, I'm sorry, be g of z minus. Is that how I want to do it? I mean, z plus z naught. So now if I put in zero, that would just be the point z naught. So we're just shifting things, and we're just moving the region. So we're really mapping zero to zero. But I'll, I'll, I'll draw it over here. It's just going to simplify the expression. What do we know about the function f? It's holomorphic. So because it's holomorphic, what do we know? I'm sorry? Continuous. It's continuous. We know a little bit more than continuous. What do we know about a holomorphic function? We know it's differentiable. Be more specific. What do we know about a holomorphic function? How do you spell holomorphic? I'll accept two spellings. That's a hint. How do you spell holomorphic? <laughs> A-N-A-L holomorphic. Right. Anybody ever see the movie Aquila and the Bee? So uh, we're wa we're rewatching that in my family right now and they're doing spelling words. I would love to have a scene with Lawrence Fishburne arguing, no, no, that's a valid spelling of holomorphic. Right? This is the other reason why I want to do this proof is you know, you guys are getting rusty, you've forgotten how to spell. Right? When you see holomorphic, you should be immediately thinking it's analytic. I have a series expansion. Let me use it. All right. How does the series expansion start? It has to be zero plus. So I'll write it as you know a n z to the n plus a n plus one with n strictly greater than zero because we know it has a zero. So, does the an really bother us that much? Yeah, I can even if I want to, I can rescale f and I can divide f by an, right? I could also pull out the an. Do we all agree the an doesn't really matter? So you know, we've done. You know, we should have the without loss of generality board. You know, w naught equals zero, z naught equals zero. A n equals one, right? So it's sometimes just nice to try to keep the algebra clean. All right. What would you like to do with this expression now? Just yeah, let's factor out z to the n. So it's z to the n, one plus a n plus one, z plus a n plus two z squared. But if you want, we can write this as f of z is z to the n, 1 plus h of z. And we know h of z is close to 0 when z is close to 0. h of z close to 0 when z is close to 0. Okay, how does this help us? If you had your choice, what would you like h of z to be? Zero. Okay. Okay, no. <laughs> there is a limit to how much you can assume without loss of generality. But you know, let, let, let's just do that case first. You know, let's build some intuition. And you know, again, right now, the reason I'm doing this proof is not because I love doing algebra on the board, but I really want to highlight and talk about how you think about these problems. So k 
case absurd, h of z equals 0. This is more than you can reasonably assume, but let's just see what would happen if h of z equals 0. Then we would have f of z is z to the n. We're trying to show it's an open map. So we want to find z such that f of z equals w with w very small, close to 0. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just assuming so many unreasonable things, I figured, what's one more? All right. How should we write w? Yes. Yeah. So if w equals r e to the i theta, try z sub w will be r to the 1 over n e to the i theta over n. And because we're assuming our function is defined on an open set and 0 is in that set, we know all the points sufficiently close to 0 are in omega. So this is in omega if r is small. And we get f of this special point z, w, is w. So we are able to solve it in the special case when f of z is z to the n. So then the only question is, what if we had something else? So there's a couple of ways we can go about this. I think I see how to do this using Rouchet's theorem. Or maybe, um, no. No, I can't quite use Rouchet's theorem. Because what I was wondering is, could we look at it as z to the n plus z to the n times this and say that this whole thing is less than absolute, that the absolute value of f maybe is less than the absolute value of g. So what if we wrote this as f of z is z to the n plus z to the n h of z? So unfortunately, since I'm calling this f, I'll have to call this maybe my function a of z and b of z. Is a of z strictly greater than b of z in absolute value if z is sufficiently small? Not Why not necessarily? Well, they both converge to 0, and we don't necessarily know how fast h converges. Ah, but h of z has an extra factor of z, Ooh. right? It's a series that converges. So must b of z be less than a of z in absolute value? I think yes. For small enough z, because h of z is going to 0. If you choose z sufficiently small, <coughs> b of z is less than a of z if z is very small. And this will be a way to see how good the uh, lighting is and if people can read that. So now whose theorem can we use? We can now use Rouchet. So basically what we did here is we tried to avoid using Rouchet. We tried to argue directly. And then we said, oh, but wait, we, we can use Rouchet here. But it now maybe is a more natural Rouchet. The other one was a Rouchet, and we had to figure out, you know, why do we want to look at it like this way? And we're using these two this function of two variables, and for each point w, we get a different function g of w. Here, I'm hoping that this looks like a natural way to do things. Okay? So, we've still got time. All right, we have 10 more minutes left. Let's prove Rouché, I'm sorry, let's prove open mapping again. How many of you have ever read Choose Your Own Adventures? All right, so, you know, at this point in the Choose Your Own Adventure, you know, you can decide to, you can elect to use Rouché's theorem. In which case, you know, turn to page 27 and the proof is done. Or you can say, I hate Rouché, may he rot in hell, and turn to page 43 and continue doing algebra. All right, so we'll now turn to page 43. We will not use Rouché, and we will see what we can do. All right. So the first thing 
was we had the absurd case h of z equals 0. What if 1 plus h of z equals g of z to the nth power? What if there's some function g such that g of z to the n is 1 plus h of z? I'm not going to say whether or not this is reasonable. But let's imagine this happened. If so, then f of z would be z to the n, g of z to the n, which would be z, g of z to the n. And what do we know g of 0 equals? Oh, do we have a g previously? No, no, not in this one. We don't have a g yet. So what must g of 0 be? And g of 0 must be 1, because it's 1 plus h of z. So we now have basically f of z looks like this function you know, g, I'm sorry, z times g of z to the n. And we want to find a way to set this equal to w. Do we think we can do this? It's almost like we're doing some kind of change of variable. And again, if we can't even do simple cases, then it may be impossible to do the more general case. So do you think we could solve it in this case? Can we solve, you know, z, g of z is w to the 1 over n? So this is an opportunity to talk about a theorem that you probably have not seen, or if you've seen, you've probably forgotten. There's a pair of functions in real analysis called the inverse and implicit function theorems. How many of you have heard of them? That they exist? That there are conditions when you can pass from, and you can invert functions. And so can I solve something like this? And then, of course, you could ask, you know, well, what if I had the real analog? What if I had you know, x, g of x? You know, would I be able to solve something like this? And I know that this expression has to start off, its leading term is going to be z, because g of 0 is 1. So this function, if we let, uh, we're running out of letters, but let's let c of z be z, g of z. This is going to be z plus, you know, c2 z squared plus dot 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 c prime of 0 is 1. The derivative of this function at 0, the point we care about, is 1. It's not 0. So if you remember these inverse implicit function theorems, this is essentially the condition we need for invertibility. So that we should be able to invert this. How many of you have at least heard of inverse implicit? How many of you can begin to appreciate now Boucher's theorem and what it's allowing us to bypass? You have to do enough of hellish math to really appreciate the power of some of these results and see what you're trying to do. Now, we could try to find um, you know, a value of z maybe recursively or whatnot and try to figure out how would we invert a relationship like this. So I don't want to go into too much detail. I want to do enough detail so that you can see what you need to do. And then if you want, you know, there are ways to look up this and to try to make this rigorous. But what we're really trying to do is we're trying to find an inverse function. And in the special case when h of z was 0, it's very easy to find the inverse function. If we can write it as a power like this, it's not so bad. So the question is, do we think 
that this is a reasonable assumption. Do we think that if we have something like this, that we can write this as the nth power of something? So it all comes down to that question. So does there exist a G such that 1 plus H of Z equals G of Z to the N? What do you think? So do you think we can always write this? Because you know, H of Z is going to be, remember, it's going to be near 0 when Z is close to 0. So this function is going to be near 1. But maybe H of Z is Z to the fifth. And then can you write 1 plus Z to the fifth as G of Z to the N? And if you can't, then that means that argument there will completely break down. But maybe we can then try to do it another way. Can we just try to find... Um, what can we say about the 1 over nth root of this? So does 1 plus g of z is 1 plus h of z to the 1 over n. Is this holomorphic? So do you think this function 1 plus h of z to the 1 over n, do you think this is holomorphic? So is it easier to write it in that way? What do you think? So is 1 plus h of z to the 1 over n holomorphic if z is small? Good, but because h of z is very, very small, if you think about what this is doing in the complex plane, here's 0. h of 0 is 1. If z is sufficiently small, all of these numbers are going to be very close to 1. So I can use the same nth root for all of them. You're absolutely right that if this had a large variation, I could have problems in terms of how do I assign roots. But because they're all close in absolute they're all close to 1, this should be a well-defined value. So what do you think the derivative should be? So if we call this g of z, what do you think g prime of z would be? Doesn't that seem like that should be the derivative? Right? So if this function exists, we've just shown this function is differentiable once. If it's differentiable once, what do you know? It's differentiable infinitely often, and it has a Taylor series expansion. We don't actually have to write things down and solve it exactly. We just need to know that such a thing exists. And so I think this is enough to actually get that there is such a function g. You know, finding it is another story. But I think we can actually argue that we can reduce to the case where we have z to the n, g of z to the n. And then we just have to invert, you know, z, g of z equals, um, you know, w to the 1 over n or something like that. So I think this is a good place to stop. Um, hopefully you have a newfound appreciation of Rouchet's theorem and a sense of how you would try to use it. You know, the real challenge is figuring out which functions to look at. And that's why I wanted to spend so much time on these results. Okay.